All right, so uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, a chaotic encryption key system. It's not, it's not an encryption algorithm. It's more like a ratcheting thing. It's a, it's a research project, so just be open-minded. We're still looking for uh, ideas. We've still got a lot of challenges to uh, solve. Um, so yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about that. So uh, I'm Jean-Francois Cloutier from uh, Quebec. Um, I'm working for my own small company, which is uh, Arcos Research. We're doing consulting, and we are um, uh, investing in research as well. And, and I'm, I'm Francois Gagnon. I'm a teacher at Cégep saint foy We also uh, do research in the Cybersecurity Research Lab. So this presentation will be divided into uh, five big parts. Uh, at first, we'll do just a small overview of what complexity sciences are, uh, what they are studying, what is a chaotic system, and then we will talk about the, the concept that we are presenting today. Um, after that, we'll do a small demo, discuss about the future work that still needs to be done, uh, and the challenges that we have, and we'll have uh, uh, time for questions as well. So a brief history of that uh, complexity sciences is... Uh, uh, in 1892, uh, they were trying to find a way to uh, uh, improve navigations with, uh, with the boats without necessarily using like stars and all, all those things. So they were working on uh, the three-body problem to try to define like uh, the position of the people on Earth or on seas by using the position of the sun, Earth, and the moon. And Henri Poincaré just discovered that there is no general mathematical solution at the, to the three-body problem, just only approximations that will uh, necessarily uh, offset over time and will be um, you know, not very accurate on the long term. Then it took almost 70 years later for uh, Edward Lawrence um, in 63 to, uh, to explicitly demonstrate that you could have a completely erratic chaotic result um, with only three variables, which is uh, quite small. Then uh, almost 10 years later, uh, he was able to explain um, why it was happening. It was because very small changes in the initial conditions will yield to drastically different results. So that, that's a butterfly effect. So again, it was just uh, rediscovering or explaining why you could only approximate, and the approximation is not um, accurate in the long term because you have what we call a strange attractor, which is a kind of a point o over which uh, the result will oscillate, but the oscillation will uh, hit at some point a tipping point and just oscillate over another attractor, but it will still be uh, non-accurate and highly unpredictable. Uh, then in 75, um, following those researches, uh, Lee and York were, were the first to use the term chaos to, uh, to describe those behaviors of uh, some systems. Then in the, at the beginning of the 80s, uh, there was a bunch of people, uh, amongst them Brian Arthur. Uh, he was an economist with a very strong math background, and he was studying all, the, all those uh, <laughs> economical um, theories, which are... Well, I, I don't want to. I don't know if there's an economist in here, but uh, sometimes economists are way off the map with uh, their theories, like the invisible hand and uh, things like that. So he discovered that uh, you, you could have increasing returns, which is feedback loops that you could uh, cause lock ins in the system. And he also explained why the butterfly effect was happening, and why over time a chaotic system is absolutely inaccurate. Uh, it's, uh, it's, caused to, it's because of the path dependency or sequence dependency. So without knowing the, ex the exact sequence, you cannot predict the future, and you cannot um, backtrack as well, because the sequence is not existing anymore uh, once you get there. So, You've met with uh, several people, like uh, Murray Gell-Mann, uh, a physicist, a Nobel Prize. And at the mid-'80s, they, they created uh, the Santa Fe Institute, uh, which is uh, an institute studying complexity sciences. So that was the beginning of the science. So what exactly is complexity sciences? That's 
That's the question. Mainly, very uh, simple explanation could be that the complexity sciences is studying low-dimensional chaotic systems and high-dimensional chaotic systems. So sorry for that. It's a very uh, theoretical part, <laughs> but uh, just don't know. Just try to stay awake. It's uh, I know it's could be boring. So a low-dimensional chaotic system is a set of intricate variables or agents in relation. It's erratic and seemingly random. Seemingly because uh, it's uh, nonlinear, but it's still deterministic. But you cannot always express them using mathematical equations because uh, even maths have some limitations uh, when studying uh, some phenomena. A high dimensional chaotic system, it's still a set of intricate variables or agents. Uh, it's erratic, but it also possesses real random properties. It's nonlinear and non deterministic. And they cannot be represented at all because of the non deterministic factor by mathematical equations, which uh, makes sense. And all that because agents in the system can adapt, learn, uh, change, or act uh, in a way that is totally random. So, can th those two types of systems interact together? If it's closed systems, or autonomous? No. If it's open to other system, yes, they can. What, what, what's happening if you have two different uh, systems interacting together with different dimensionality? Let's say you have system A, this, which is a low dimensional system, and you have the system B, which is high dimensional system. Uh, the meta system AB, if they are interacting together because of the mutual impact, will become in, in turn high dimensional. That's, a, that's an interesting point that we'll uh, discuss later. So examples of chaotic systems, uh, meteorological systems, biological systems like Francois or uh, anybody of you, or when you talk together, you're, you're a high-dimensional chaotic system itself. Gravitational system like solar systems, galaxies, universe, um, social networks, stock market, and colonies, some types of uh, nuclear reactions as well. Um, what, what are the characteristics of uh, those systems? You have agents and variables and relations. You have temporal factors because it's still uh, um, temporal dependent. It's an evolution. You have tipping points. You have uh, opacity because you can't always know exactly what's happening in the system in the relations, in the agents. Um, and because of those characteristics, it generates uh, a combinatorial explosion that could be, um, like for I-dimensional chaotic systems, absolutely uh, infinite. So because of those characteristics, chaotic systems are highly unpredictable or not predictable at all. Uh, for, the rest, uh, for the second part of the presentation, uh, Francois will uh, explain you exactly what a concept is about and how it works. Okay, so what I'll try to do is I'll try to explain to you how we can uh, leverage the chaotic systems into, um, uh, for, for, to use for encryption or specif specifically for key management. Um, so just to set the expectation, let's, let's talk about what, what is it and what it's not. So it's definitely a research project. So whenever you feel something is wrong about it, it's because it's the research project. So. Um, <laughs> That's it. <coughs> so whenever you, all the question at the end, the answer will be, well, it's a research project. Um, it's in ver very, very early stage, so we don't have answers to all the questions, but please do ask them anyway. Maybe we, we haven't asked some question ourselves. Uh, it is a key management paradigm. It's not an encryption uh, algorithm like uh, AES or, or something like that. And we do have an implementation. An implementation. Uh, it is implementation, so it's not a good implementation yet. So how it works. Um, what we're going to use is we're going to use two chaotic systems, two copy of the same chaotic systems, um, uh, one on, on each client that want to talk uh, together. And they will be, we'll, we'll, we'll put them in a, in a setup that they are co-evolving, uh, so they, they are synchronized. And those chaotic systems will generate uh, keys that will, be, will change the keys for every message. Um, so what we have, a few properties that we have is that they, they will look random, um, and uh, well, look is a, um, 
an important word here. Uh, we don't know yet how random they are. We haven't studied that. Um, the theory says that it will be pretty random, but um, it's not clear yet what it, what it is. Uh, they will have to stay synchronized all the way, so that's going to be a problem. We'll talk about it. Uh, our key will be used only once. Then we throw them away. We, we evolve the system and generate a new, a new key. And uh, they won't be exchanged over the network. So the, the systems are evol evolving, and the keys are generated locally. They don't have to uh, transit on the network. <coughs> so let's say we have a chaotic system uh, which is built of uh, 48 agents. Each agent has many properties. One of them we call the level, which is uh, 8 bits. <coughs> and what we'll do is we'll take the level of each agent at a specific moment, and from that we'll, de we'll derive key material. So for uh, 48 agents, we will get uh, 384 bits. So when, with that, we can uh, use a part for a key and a part for an IV. <coughs> and uh, so what, what's important in, in all this is that the key part or the key material is just a very, very small portion of the whole system. Uh, so the agent has a level, but it has many other properties, and those properties are very important for the evolution of the system, but we don't use them for uh, key material. Uh, just to give you a quick overview of what an agent looks like or what a system looks like. So we could have, uh, for example, a, a system with 48 agents. Each has, a, uh, as I said, 8, bit, eight bits level. Um, each agent has a bunch of rule sets. <coughs> so 256 rule sets. The rules, so th think about it, about the graph. The nodes are the agents and the rule set are the uh, connections between the nodes and each agent impact other agents, including possibly itself, and the graph will be evolving, so the graph will be ever-changing. At some point, we'll have a complete graph, at some point, we'll have a disconnected graph, so the, um, the chaotic behavior will come and modify the, the underlying graphs. So when we pick, for, for the key, we pick only the, the level, so the, the number in the nodes, but then there's the whole structure behind that is uh, um, not related to the key part, or not directly related to the key part. And there's a, um, a notion of delays that uh, a connection at one point will have an impact in some future in the system. So the impact is not always right away. <coughs> uh, it's quite hard to get an idea of, of what is the space of all this, or what is the combinatorial explosion about this. Um, we're, we're looking on it. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not easy. We don't have a clear answer. What we do know, and I'll talk about a little bit about that later, is that um, even the, you know, the combinatorial explosion is really huge. There's going to be a bunch of equivalent states uh, that are not exactly the same as in number, but they might behave exactly the same. And we'll, I'll just maybe come back quickly later. <coughs> so. Uh, again, with the key space, so I'm just going to focus on one agent in my system just to show you a, a property that's quite, in, we believe is quite interesting. So we've got agent A1. Of course, there's other bunch of, another bunch of agents in the system. Uh, so A1 starts at level 5, and it has another, um, other values for the other parameters. Uh, so P represents all the other parameters. Uh, I'm not going to give values for those parameters in the example. So when the system evolves, the, the, the agent A1 would, will change its level from 5 to, let's say, 12. And this change will, will be impacted by other agents as well. So the red arrows show potential impact for other agents. So then A1 will continue to evolve, 29, 28, blah, 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 3. Two. And at some point, obviously, it will come back to a level of 5. <coughs> But what's interesting here is that the next step will not be 12, or will not always be 12, because there's, there are other factors that will impact the evolution, and uh, the parameters are probably not going to be the same. So even though the, the key generated by A1, or the key part that is generated by A1 is the same, um, the next evolution will not be the same. So, so we that, can... Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So Earlier, when I was talking about sequence dependency, if you don't know where the system 
is from, you can't know where it's going. So that's exactly that because of the delays and stocks in the system, right? So we can imagine that at some point, uh, generating a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, lots of keys will get exactly the same key uh, that we've previously seen, but the next one of that key will not be the next one of the, the same key in the previous states. So the loop will be much longer. Eventually, we're going to loop, right? but it's going to be much, much, much longer. Uh, so then again, we generate new keys, and then at some other point, we'll fall in a, in a, on a state that has been previously visited, and then we'll go in another direction because of the other parameters. <coughs> All right, so um, that was for key material. So how, how the system works, <coughs> uh, and it's, it's quite similar in, uh, to what Trevor uh, uh, talked previously. So uh, if Alice and Bob want to, want, they want to talk together, they will each have a pair of systems that are matched together. So for instance, um, the output of Alice will be a system, so a system ID, a one, two, three, four, five, six, and that's going to be the input system of Bob, and then the output system of Bob, one, A, two, B, three, C, will be the input system of Alice. So they have to have matching systems, <coughs> a pair of matching systems. So if we take a message from Alice sending to Bob, so they both have the same system. <coughs> Alice will generate a key from the system, so give me a key will encrypt the message uh, she wants to send with whatever uh, encryption algorithm she wants to use, so they have to agree with that. Uh, she's going to send the cipher to Bob. Bob's going to derive a key from the co-evolving system, so he's going to get the same key. Then they will, uh, he will decrypt the message using the same algorithm. And then, important part, they will both evolve the system to get in a new state, where they can generate the next key. So the evolution will be um, quite important, and they have to uh, stay synchronized. If one evolves and the other doesn't, then we're kind of, uh, we have a problem because now they cannot decrypt uh, the message of each other. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we keep systems synchronized or how we fail to, in, in possibly in that case, and what needs to be addressed. <coughs> So for uh, first, let's start with the uh, sender. Um, so right now, the sender will evolve his system. So he's, he's sending the message over TCP. And as soon as he receives the acknowledge from the TCP, he evolves its system. OK, so it's, um, um, well, it's, it's, not, it's not really secure. So we could uh, desynchronize those systems uh, simply by having an attacker that's doing something like a man in the middle, preventing the message to get to Bob, so Bob will not evolve the system and just faking uh, an acknowledge, and then Alice will e evolve her system. Um, of course, the, the, the agent, the, 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 the attacker has to have full control over the network to do that, or, or a good control over the network, but what's interesting here that wouldn't happen, let's say, for uh, another attack using, we can do that as well with, with SSL or, or something. Um, is she has to do it only once. So she prevents one message to reach Bob, she sends a fake acknowledge, and then she disappears from, from the network. She doesn't have to man in the middle anymore. The system are unsynchronized, and then the attacker doesn't need to be there anymore. So if, oh, obviously, we'll have to work on that to have a safer acknowledge. That's not been done yet. From the other way around, so when the receiver will evolve his system, um, so if we only encrypt the message, send the message, then there's nothing telling Bob that what he receive and decrypts is not just garbage. How can he differentiate between garbage? So if an, an attacker just sends garbage to Bob, Bob decrypts and says, all right, you send me that message, I'm going to evolve. So we need to have a stronger, I'm going to skip, skip through those, and we need to have a stronger way to authenticate um, the message. What is interesting, so where we'll go is the last one. Um, what is interesting is that we don't have a shortage of key. We can generate key material. We've got lots, lots of, of uh, key material. So we can use one key to encrypt the message and another key to authenticate the message with something like HMAC or uh, that it requires a, a key. And, and the two parties, the two entities, 
will have those key uh, generated from the chaotic system. So instead of using generating a 384 bits of key, we need a longer key, one part for encryption, one part, one part for authentication. Um, so what happens if, if the, the attacker gets an encrypted message, then he has to brute force, in, in this case, two key, one for uh, encryption, one for authentication. So that, that's nothing new there. Um, so what happens if uh, he gets an encrypted message and the two keys, so, or, or the keys used for that message? Um, so obviously, he can get the plain text easily. But since the keys are used only once, then after decrypting that message, there's nothing he can do anymore. And the keys are not related. So having the key, or, or in, in chaotic system, it translates to having the level of all the agent as a specific point doesn't help you predict what's going to be the next step, because you need, uh, as Jean-François told before, you need the history to predict the next key. So you don't know what's going to happen next. <coughs> now what if he gets an encrypted message plus the initial state? <coughs> Um, so now there's going to be a problem. We're going to solve that problem. Um, so if he has an encrypted message, so, um, an attacker will have the encrypted message. If he has also the initial system state, then he can catch up. He can simulate his own system and catch up. So he, he takes the initial state, generate a first key, um, decipher the message, get something that could be the plain text, then get the second key to authenticate the message and say, ah, oh, authentication doesn't work, so let's evolve our system, do the same thing. They don't match. <coughs> He's going to do that a bunch of time, about a few times, and then at some point, he's going to get, he's going to catch up with the state of the, the, the system for the two uh, parties, and he's going to be able to decrypt the message, and then he's in sync when the with the system. So how we solve this particular problem um, is that we're using the message content to impact the system evolution. So an attacker would need to we need to guess or to have access to all the messages in ex exchanged so far um, to be able to catch up. So it, it's, it's still possible if you have the initial system and the full set of message exchange uh, to do a catch up, but you cannot do it with only one uh, message. Uh, so the idea here is that the evolution will take um, the, the exchange message as a parameter, and from a specific state, if you evolve with a given message, you end up in, one, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a state Y, and if you evolve with another message, you end up in a completely different state. Um, that's also interesting is here, the evolution, because it might end up breaking the uh, equivalency of the state. So you might have two equivalent systems, but since they are poked with something external, then they are not equiv equivalent anymore. So we're going to um, see if we can uh, have a better complex or better combinatorial uh, explosion with, with this, with this, this thing. Um, an idea we're, we're toying with, so it's really important that it's an idea, is using something that's related to the one-time pad. So if we have a, so we're in a specific state, we, have, we want to encry uh, encrypt a message uh, of whatever, 900 bits. Uh, so we're creating a clone of our system. <coughs> and then we're going to generate key material, as much key material as we need from that system. So in that case, we're going to need three states. These states are evolving without uh, any input from the, the outside. So the evolution here is, is with the empty message. And we generate enough key material. We encrypt our initial message. Uh, then the evolution of the original system will be done with the message and parameters. So that's going to end up with a completely new state that's not related with state x, x plus 1, or x plus 2. And then we can delete all the clone we've got uh, and keep going just with the uh, main system. <coughs> this is. Uh, uh, the same idea here of having a clone and evolving the clone will be applied uh, to get one key, to get two key, or to get three key. So if we need one key for encryption, one key for authentication, um, then we'll use the, we're using the same idea of cloning the system, generate the keys, 
on that clone and then evolving the main. Uh, <coughs> so we'll go back to uh, Jean-Francois. So we had a great debate this morning uh, whether we're, would we use my computer or his computer. So I apologize to Windows computer because that, that's his computer. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so uh, just a little uh, precision is that when we say that the message is impacting the evolution, we're talking about the plain text message. So to guess the evolution of the system, you would first need to decrypt uh, the messages. But to decrypt the messages, you need to guess the evolution. So it's kind of the, the chicken or the egg problem here. So let's say we generate like a 256 um, bits key. It, it takes a few seconds because uh, it's like thousands of thousands of parameters that we need to uh, initialize. So it's like three seconds. But uh, after that, if we say that we want to generate like 100,000 uh, keys, it's going to be a uh, Kind of fast. Yeah. Hmm. Did I put uh, an extra zero or? <laughs> well. <laughs> oh yeah, I think I, I just rolled a million, so it uh, it should take about like 290 seconds, so less than 0.3 milliseconds per uh, key generation and evolution and all the the rest. So ba based on that, you can uh, we uh, we created a very simple test chat application. So we first need need to uh, open uh, a system definition, which will uh, just uh, you know with matching systems. Then we uh, we put the listener. Then what we can do is the, like send a message. It's going to be encrypted, decrypted, and if we send the message a couple of times, like. One, the second time, a third time, or even a uh, fourth time. What we can see is that because the keys are changing and the message is uh, impacting the evolution of the system and a bunch of other parameters, uh, the IV will be different, the authentication of the message will be encrypted using a different key, and the message in itself will be uh, encrypted using a different key. So. Um, yeah, so it makes things uh, a little bit harder to um, to decrypt, even with the same message. So we still have lots of uh, future work to uh, to do. Um, we need to prevent malicious desynchronization. Um, because right now it's only like on the TCP ACK that we are tri triggering the evolution. Um, if, you, if you guys have any ideas, we, we have discussed like a few ideas, like we could use a kind of one-way DH calculation just to send um, an acknowledge that could be understood only by someone having the previous information or uh, the initial message. Um, but we still need to, to discuss about it and um, see what we can do. And also we would like to work on the how could we resynchronize the system? Um, we, we didn't work on the, the initial synchronization so far, but uh, another idea could be like to use DFLMAN to uh, generate a seed that, will be, that would be used to generate the, the system at first. But, uh, or we could just not synchronize it over the internet, like if you have a dongle, a VPN dongle or something like that, or a machine-machine interface that you can just um, install yourself. Uh, but it's still like along with there because we, we need to uh, we still need to do a lot of work like to just make it work properly. So uh, we, we still need contributors, uh, help and ideas are very welcome in this project. And um, yeah, we ha we have a small challenge just to demonstrate or trying to to see if uh, someone can predict the the key sequence from having the keys only. So. Um, in the summer, what we're going to do is we have a small project that is funded by, uh, in par partly by NSERC, uh, the Research Council of Canada. And um, we will re-engineer the proof of concept uh, because uh, that, that's my own implementation. Uh, it's a proof of concept like patch over patch over patch over patch, just make it work. So uh, we're going to be building a new architecture with uh, 
a better approach from what we've learned in the past. So, uh, any questions?